And joining us now in studio, Father Jack Costello, Professor of Spiritual, Cultural and Social Justice at Regis College at the University of Toronto. Good to have you back in the studio. Thank you very much, Steve. You have a connection to Haiti. What well, is it? It's a, a small connection, actually. I've been there three or four times. Uh, I happen to be director of the uh, Jesuit Refugee and Migrant Service, and it's in that capacity that I went and uh, joined my fellow directors from different Latin American countries. And the uh, Jesuit Refugee Service is right at the border with the Dominican Republic where you cross uh, a curving bridge with Uruguayan UN forces trying to keep people from throwing each other off because it's so full all the time. And you move from Dahabon, Dominican Republic, into Wanamet, uh, Haiti. And it's a movement into mud and mm. water and just a complete movement of people Without, there are no traffic lights, at right. least I can say that. Well, one of the th obviously over the last two weeks, uh, all the media everywhere, online and on air, have explored the, you know, the life-saving aspects, the, trying, the reconstruction aspects, I mean, many, many different aspects. One aspect that the reason we've invited you here tonight is that we want to cover the religious aspect of this, the religion of the Haitian people, uh, and, and whether what transpired two weeks ago ought to make us question the existence of God. So let's do that now. How would you describe the faith of the Haitian people? Well, I would describe it as very relational. There is no faith apart from the community of the Haitian people. I would call it vibrant. I would call it profoundly interior and profoundly a mix of what we would call spirit, the physical, and, uh, and ordinary life. And what have you heard about how religious Haitians, devout Haitians, are reacting to what transpired two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. Well, I haven't been there, first mm -hmm. of all. So if we're talking about this is the situation now, how are they dealing with it? I get my news through the Jesuit Refugee Service, and they say the people are responding with a great degree of resilience. But does this you know, make them question their faith in their religion or in their God? That doesn't seem to be happening. Whether there are people who have despondency at the loss of all their family, I haven't heard of any who say, God is not with us. Uh, and you and I have probably seen on television as the people line up to get water. They were in lineups, and then the singing begins. And there is an actual singing that is um, joyful. It's at least centered. And what it reminded me of was the people singing in the streets of South Africa as they were moving away from apartheid. And this sense of song at the heart of expression and expression of a continuing sense of the goodness of life despite the horrors of the present well, situation. Well, explain that to us because how does one keep one's faith in the face of what has just transpired? Well, maybe because it's not statistical. <laughs> The, the Haitian people, we have to understand, have lived in poverty. Mm. They have lived in a sense of incredible simplicity of life, having very little to go on. Uh, they do not have a highly trustworthy political system that they can count on for justice. They have to make do, and they make do with one another and with their faith. There is one thing that I found with the Haitian people, and certainly with the people I was with in Haiti, is that they really believe God loves them, and that's the heart and soul and anchor of their lives over against total unpredictability economically, politically, socially, and then with the foreigners. Hmm. Let me read a quote then to that, and this was in the New York Times uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, in a like, so chapter of our discussion we'll call, Does God Hate Haiti? Bishop Arab Toussaint, standing near his damaged cathedral, said, Why give thanks to God? Because we are here. What happened is the will of God. We are in the hands of God now. Haitians, he said, need to reinvent themselves to find a new path to God. I blame man. God gave us nature, and we Haitians and our governments abused the land. You cannot get away without consequences. One man told the Times last week. What role do you believe God plays in tragedies such as the Haitian earthquake? It's a very good and classic 
question. And because I teach uh, philosophical theology, it's one I address at least sometimes in my class. Um, I do not uh, believe Thomas Aquinas was wrong in making a distinction between that which God permits and that which God intends. Hmm. And that distinction was done theologically precisely in the face of huge evil. Because any Christian, any Jew, is going to, and basically the believers in any world religion, Muslim included, is God is ever present. God is present in what? In mercy, in power, in goodness, in care, in compassion, even in tears. And basically, the, uh, the sense of God um, being one who is there in presence, not necessarily as the um, basically deist position of the early modern period held. If he's not there in a power that can overcome power, he's not real. So those who want to ask the question, how can God allow this evil to happen, he doesn't intend it to happen. Is that what you're he saying? He does not intend it to happen, but God is present as it happens, and with its happening, God, uh, uh, the pr preferential option for the poor is a way of saying God is even more caring for those who are most vulnerable, for those who are most deprived of the goodness of, th of life. And so the presence of God is, in fact, in the Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition, shown to be primarily love, but a love that has the face of vulnerability itself. Do you find that a and satisfying answer, though? I, I'm not saying it, uh, that is the end of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, at this point in the conversation, I was just saying the uh, face of vulnerability in Jesus on the cross and a face of strength and power in Jesus in the resurrection is a way of saying we hold to a mystery that love is stronger than death, and none of us can explain it. My view about the problem of evil and where God was is to say the Haitian people never deal with the problem of evil the same way 18th century white Europeans did. They will deal with evil. They will not over-intellectualize it. And when they deal with evil, they do always deal with it, it seems to me, out of my knowledge of them, in, in another thing, and that's the mystery of good. Okay, a well, problem of evil is situated in a mystery of goodness, and they have a remarkably fine capacity to detect, discern, and embrace goodness. Do you believe God unleashes natural disasters to punish those who are sinners? I do not believe God releases national disasters, and I do not believe at all that God uses them to punish. So you I think that's a misinterpretation that's of That's what Pat Robertson said in the opening clip. I do not agree with Pat Robertson that that is authentic Christianity. So where does he get off saying something like that? Uh, you'd have to say I would have to go into conjecture of a psychological nature, but I do think there's something endemic to a fundamentalist position, and there's something characteristic about a certain American filter that's put up in terms of reading these things that I find hugely questionable. I think there is a lot of cultural context in the filters through which he reads the Bible and deals with nations outside the United States. Do you think natural disasters represent a test of faith? I think they can, and they do. But is that his intention? Who, gods or pets? Yes. No. I don't think Pat's got the ability, uh, he may think he does, but I don't think he has the ability yet to unleash what was No, what but I, as I said, I don't think mm -hmm. God unleashes. I, I don't think God gives us good weather, and I don't think God gives us bad weather. God does not give us earthquakes. This is the reality of living in a material universe. This is the way it works, by material laws. And we have uh, platelets, and they are rubbing up against one another, as you and I can rub up against one another in the personal order. And physical rubbing produces physical effects. And anyone who is also physical and living on this earth 
is subject to the effects. But God is perfect, right? Omniscient, omnipresent, all those things. Why does a loving God create a geological home for those he loves that is apparently so imperfect? Well, I don't know, but I would like to see... I want a better answer than that. I, you no, know. no, no. You, you, you know you're going to get an answer from me. <laughs> but I think it's really hmm. important to start off with, I don't know. Hmm. Okay? Hmm. Otherwise, genuine believers who say, not everything reduces to a problem. Some things belong in a domain we call mystery. And for instance, a marriage is lived out in mystery beyond awful moments through good moments. And I have in mind now a couple who have a son who is autistic and Down syndrome. And what that child has done to their marriage in terms of bringing them closer together giving them a certain strength. Okay, but I'm going to interrupt because that's different. That's di that that yeah. is the scientific joining of his DNA and her DNA that for whatever reason created that. I that's not what's at issue here. We're talking about an, Im an imperfect geological creation that, you know, as you say, the platelets rubbing up against each other that's killed tens of thousands of people. Why would God do that? God has created a world that follows material laws. And the material laws re in, involve dialectic as well as dialogue. And that, I think, is something we don't know how to explain. But I, I would also put it to you, not as a challenging, but as an inviting one. Why don't we raise these questions after we have a completely beautiful day with the children, with picnics, when everything works out well? Because well? we expect God to do that, right? He's, he's, a, he's, a, gen he's a generous, wondrous, benevolent God, and yes. therefore we would expect him to create a nice sunny day. We don't understand why he would allow this to happen. That's fair to ask, right? It's a fair question yeah. to ask. It's a fair question to ask. Why does it happen with a loving God? And I think all I can say is that the journey through uh, organic life and physical life into personal life includes the elements of dialectic in the only world I know. But it's a mystery is just a completely unsatisfactory answer for a lot of people, right? You'll grant that. I will grant that. I will grant mm -hmm. the saying we live in a mystery. But I want to say that what I mean by mystery is not simply absence of intelligibility. I would say mystery represents excess of intelligibility. But what I think that any Westerner should do is have the humility of recognizing that when we, when we expect uh, when we confront a difficult situation, we tend to expect a clear, precise, rational answer that sews it up completely the way you move a lock, a combination lock three times, and the thing opens, and it's all over and done. And we don't get we that want lucky. God to be a problem. Hmm. We want, and that's why I slipped, by the way, from the physical question you asked me into the personal order, and sorry for getting derailed, but I don't think, I think it's analogous, that we want everything solved and in place. And I find that, in terms of real life, a fixation and a premise put on us at once by pain, but also by a certain period in our history. Hmm. But, there have been, I guess, a few articles written over the last little while dealing with this response of the, the problem of evil, something called theodicy. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to us what theodicy is? Well, it's a word that came up really in the 16th and 17th and 18th century. And it's an effort to speak in reasonable terms, in rational terms, about God and God in human affairs and God in the world of being. How can we speak about God such that we make sense? What kind of explanations can we offer about how what things happen, how things happen, and how those things can be explained in as reasonable a way as possible. And we had a whole history, by the way, of a lot of theologians in the 16th and uh, 17th and 18th century seriously giving themselves over to wanting to continue to be in dialogue 
with the scientists. And in so doing, they left behind a lot of biblical metaphors. They moved much more strongly into a philosophical way of expressing theology rather than a more metaphorical, biblical, relational way of doing theology. It was a, an impoverished form of doing theology to some degree that we woke up to. And we need the full tradition to do it. And the Odyssey is a narrowing of the theological project, but a necessary part. I'm going to take you back to the year 1710, because there have been numerous references to this as well. Forty years later, an earthquake strikes Lisbon, Portugal. 1710 was the German philosopher Gottfried Leibniz who, who created this term, the Odyssey. Forty years later, you get an earthquake striking Lisbon. On a church holiday, it destroys nearly every church in the city, opens the door to questions about God and faith, of course. How did that quake spur on European enlightenment? Well, I think the uh, actually earthquake occurred in 1755. So okay. you're off by five years. I'm off by a little and bit. And we were throwing, <laughs> uh, we were throwing the Acadians out of Canada that very year. <laughs> so evil abounds. <laughs> we, we got nothing to boast about then. No, well, okay. nothing to boast about, but a lot to explain. Right. You know. The earthquake is cited in terms of the Enlightenment, but an earlier instance, huge as well, was the Black Plague. Mm. In 1348 it begins, there are recurrences throughout, but the Black Plague seemed to be something that continued on its way with the people of Europe unable to get the, dog, the god they spoke to to come forward and heal the situation. And the first incursions of a genuine skepticism into the culture of Europe occurred through the Black Plague, strengthened by a new mercantilism, the rise of science and individuality. But the rise of the Enlightenment was already underway with Rousseau, yeah. and things were taking a lot of strength from it. But I think that what was happening there uh, with the earthquake in Lisbon is that you have a terrible situation that even the deists, uh, deist is a reference to a kind of attitude to God, mm. a, a certain image of God, which is God is the watchmaker who wound the world up and set it out in, in exclusively material rules and it unwinds mm -hmm. and it winds into a state where La Maitre said, Steve Pakin is simply a machine. He's a sophisticated machine, but he can be explained in mechanical terms only. They had no idea how to deal with the fact that this God who had wound up the world would allow this kind of thing to happen. Mm -hmm. And since they insisted that all problems be submitted to rationality, they were in a situation where they couldn't go forward. They had to give up on it. There's only one way to go, and that's atheism. Just let go of the God hypothesis, as Laplace did. When Napoleon said, you've given me a wonderful theory, Monsieur Laplace, where's the place of God in your hypothesis? Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, Your Excellency, there is no need for God in my hypothesis. I think that is effectively the bankruptcy of a certain way of thinking through. Either God submits to rationality and the I issues we need explained are explained thoroughly and rationally, or there is no meaning to be embraced there. I think the people of Haiti give an alternative. Okay, here's philosopher David Hume in the year America was born asking some pretty good questions. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is impotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? You want to try answering those? I, no. Frankly, I, I don't because <laughs> I, have, I have studied Hume and I uh, have offered something of an explanation of how Hume sits at the edge of the early period of modern thinking and moves into the secondary period. We're going to go into a more romantic period in philosophy, 
Kant is going to raise different questions based on Hume's skepticism. Mm -hmm. But basically, I don't think those are answerable in the terms in which they're presented. It tends to be what I've been talking about already, the reduction of God to a rational explanation. God's made a problem. But if you use parenting, if you use friendship as a model of God's presence, I could say, Steve, count on me right to the end. Hmm. I'll be with you as a friend right to the end, and you find it's true. You end up with a whole sense of meaning and meaningfulness that is beyond rational explanation, but absolutely true. And I think the Haitian people live somewhere in a primacy of relationship, a primacy of mutual care, and it's on that kind of basis where they meet God and celebrate God that they find the absolute ground of their lives has not been taken away. Abandoned by the politicians, abandoned by France, abandoned by the United States, abandoned by corruption, but not abandoned by the one who says, I will love you always. In which case, why do you think some humans, not those humans obviously, but why do some humans seek to attach meaning to events such as this? I think because it's such a painful situation to, to be able to explain something that's painful does help us, always. Hmm. We're consoled by explanation. Finding the intelligibility of a very difficult situation helps. Hmm. If suffering builds moral character, why do some people seem to be made to suffer disproportionately to others? And I think the people in Haiti probably come under the category of disproportionately having suffered. Right, but I don't grant the premise that suffering necessarily builds character. We know of people who have suffered and have just been ground to, to the dust. Hmm. Um, so I, I would not ever uh, try to present a moral case for suffering on the grounds that it builds character. It can build character. It doesn't always do so, and very often doesn't do so. Check out our prisons. Okay, one more. Is, um, well, I know what your answer is going to be, but there's going to be people who are going to say, that which happened in Haiti proves God doesn't exist. Right. How would you counter that? I would say keep your eye on the television. Keep your eye on the flow of people across every nation we know of who have responded. Can we give? What can we give? What can we send? What can we do? Should we go there personally? I will do anything to help Haiti. The government of Canada is surprised by the number of people and the amount of money flowing in for Haiti. But God gets credit for that? I say everything that is of benevolence between human beings. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 25 says, whatever you do for one another, you will be doing for me because you are my face, you are my hands, you are my heart. I live in you. What you do for one another, you do for me. And, uh, and I think the mystery that we tend to recognize in an act of faith, but it is so hopeful for so many people, is the way Jesus can be described as the face of the divine in the human and the face of the human in the divine. We ourselves, as human beings, are on a divine vocation to love one another well. What I am saying is this, self-transcendence, a great word for Václav Havel, mm -hmm. and a great word for Albert Camus, is what so many people, including the Haitians themselves, are being drawn to. Who needs help? I remember this fabulous scene in the first week. This young woman somehow found a casket for her mother who had died, was burying her, and these young men were going by, and the casket needed to be covered and the young men just walked over and with their hands started putting the earth on the casket, joining her in community that her mother might have a decent burial and doing what they could do for someone they didn't know, but it was one of them. And that earth on hands, on the casket, creating a sacrament of decency 
and positive relationship is the divine among us. Father Costello, really glad you came in tonight to discuss some of these very, very troubling issues with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Steve, for having me.